Okay. So, good evening, friends, and uh, welcome to the radiology recall sessions of January 2023. There are a lot of questions that were coming in radiology, and I hope you got most of them right. Like, we'll discuss the questions that came in, and do let me know in the chat box at the end, like how many you got right, and I hope you get your, you know, most of your uh, questions and radiology correct. Let's get uh, started with this. You should, uh, you know, look at this with two views. One is to understand, not just to look at what you did right, what you did wrong. These are recall questions, right, given by different students. So don't, uh, you know, unnecessarily get worried that this was the question, that was the question. If you feel anything is significantly different, you can let me know in the chat. And uh, but, you know, there is a high importance of recall questions. Even in this exam, if you have seen, lot of questions were on the previous year questions. So, being very sure about the previous year questions is important. Let us get started now. So, uh, hello, Dr. Siraj. Let us get started. The first one, what did you answer for this? Two days old newborn baby presented with the frothing from mouth and difficulty in breathing. The following radiograph is obtained from the child. What is the diagnosis? Tracheal fistula, transcend unital apnea, haline membrane disease or meconium aspiration. So, what was your answer guys? You can put it in the chat box. Let me see. I am viewing your chat box. If you can interact. What did, the, what did you answer this? Yes. You can see here there is coiling of the nasogastric tube. There is coiling of nasogastric tube. Coiling of nasogastric tube. And this coiling of nasogastric tube along with stomach in uh, having you know a distension with air these things will tell you that there is a connection between the trachea and the esophagus there is a coiling of nasogastric tube and also there is distension of the stomach this is suggestive of a distal tracheoesophageal fistula so tracheoesophageal fistula should be your correct answer here and uh, frothing from the mouth newborn baby everything is given so this is tracheoesophageal fistula i hope you got this correct now look at the next one identify the structure marked by the arrow and they had given an arrow somewhere like this on the arrow right i think there was more laterally like this they had given an arrow just like this and they asked you what is this and uh, please remember whenever you are counting the ribs always remember the posterior ribs are horizontal and anterior ribs are oblique so this is your posterior rib this is your posterior rib which will be horizontal and posterior ribs are horizontal and anterior ribs are oblique anterior ribs are oblique and most students said that the answer was fourth posterior rib, right? The fourth posterior rib. Uh, is that correct? Most of you got that as fourth posterior rib only in your exam, right? I hope you have answered it as fourth posterior rib in the exam. Next one. The next question A patient met with road traffic accident presents in an unconscious state. Blood pressure is normal and a non contrast CT image is obtained. You can see here there is a non contrast CT image given. And what is the likely diagnosis? Very straightforward. All of you must got it right. Right? This is epidural hematoma. Epidural hematoma. Biconvex, lentiform. Right? Does it cross sutures or does not cross sutures? Does it cross sutures or does not cross sutures? Does not cross sutures. Right? So does not cross sutures. This is epidural hematoma. And uh, there was also a question asking you to identify the mark structure and there was an arrow here in this coronal CT. So, you were given a coronal CT scan image and they asked you what is this structure given here. So, this is your maxillary sinus. Okay, So, there was some mucosal thickening there suggest you of a maxillary sinusitis. So, they asked you what is the uh, structure that is marked by the arrow and the, the arrow was given near the maxillary sinus. Right. So, I hope uh, you got that right also. And uh, there were a couple of questions actually two to three questions students were telling on barium studies. So, do your uh, GI imaging properly, identify the mark structure on the given image. So, they asked you, there was an arrow kept here and they asked you what is the mark structure. Is it first part of duodenum, second part of duodenum, third part of duodenum or jejunum? What was the answer guys? What did you mark in the exam? What did you answer for this? What part of duodenum was that? So, this was the first part of duodenum which forms the duodenal bulb. Right. So, duodenal cap or the duodenal bulb is formed by the first part of duodenum. I hope you got that right. The first part of duodenum. Now, 
then another important question a patient is diagnosed with fistula in ano what is the gold standard imaging modality so they asked you what is the gold standard imaging modality is it pet scan mri sinogram or ct scan what did you answer for this what do you answer for this the gold standard investigation for fistula in ano can i get your uh, you can reply me in the chat box i'm looking at your chat box you can reply me on the chat box what is this please remember the gold standard investigation for fistula in ano you need to when you have a fistula in ano you need to know the correct planes to know whether it is in the a transsphincteric area whether it is intersphincteric uh, fistula that is there and the management differs accordingly and mri being a multiplanar imaging it will help help you to look at the fistula in relation to the sphincters around the anal canal so it's very very important to remember that the gold standard or the best modality to look at the fistula in ano is mri right so mri is the correct answer here right so mri is the correct answer next one so this is how you are mr images so these are mri images with fast suppression you can see the fistula here right so these are the yellow arrows here this shows the fistula you can see some abscess there some fistula tract there which can be evaluated on a mri and uh, this is a sinogram so this is a sinogram or a fistulogram where you try to put the contrast inside the sinus and inject a contrast and take the radiograph so basically it's just a fistulogram you cannot evaluate its relationship with the sphincters here so that is the reason mri is much better it will help you to understand how the fistula is passing through the sphincter is it transsphincteric is it suprasphincteric or is it intersphincteric so that information you can obtain because you can look at the perineal structures better on mri and a multiplanar imaging can be done so fistula in ano is better diagnosed by mri keep that in mind and also understand how the images will appear okay the perineal structures on mri next one i hope you got this right a patient presented with abdominal pain constipation increased urination and he also has a history of renal calculi and uh, psychiatric disorders so there is a patient with abdominal pain stones and also psychic moans which of the following is useful in the diagnosis of this condition so all of this point towards hyperparathyroidism right hyperparathyroidism and usually to look at parathyroid adenoma what is the best to look at parathyroid adenoma to anatomical localization of parathyroid adenoma is best done by what is the best investigation to look at parathyroid adenoma guys what did you answer for this parathyroid adenoma parathyroid adenoma for localizing anatomical localization of parathyroid adenoma is better done by 4d ct more than technetium 99m systamiv right systamiv 4d ct or better than a technetium 99m systamiv but 4d ct is not mentioned here don't go with just ct scan 4d ct is when you take axial sagittal coronal sections of the neck ct neck along with early rtl enhancement you look at the contrast enhancement pattern early rtl enhancement of the parathyroid adenoma these four things together right so these four things together they form the 4d ct so unless 4d ct is mentioned don't answer as ct neck the better answer okay is technetium 99m sesta may be scan but if you are given both the combination of 4d ct plus sesta may be that is ideal but if it that is not given you are given options 4d ct and sesta may be go for 4d ct if only ct is given go for technetium 99m sesta may be scan so this is sesta may be scan that should be your best answer here next one now this was a question that we had discussed in radiotherapy i have taught you this in radiotherapy sessions also a cancer patient undergoing radiotherapy is given a dose of 1.8 to 2 gray once daily for 5 days so od dose for 5 days per week you give off on saturday and sunday so monday to friday you give a daily dose of radiotherapy and for a duration of about 6 to 8 weeks what is the type of radiotherapy called now this type of radiotherapy which you give in patients when you have a cancer diagnosis in your patients you give them radiotherapy of a dose of about 1.8 to 2 gray every day once daily for monday to friday with a off on saturday and sunday except on saturday and sunday every day on 5 days a week when you give radiotherapy this fractionated method of radiotherapy is the conventional fractionated radiotherapy or the regular fractionated radiotherapy 
A hyperfractionated radio therapy is used for aggressive tumors. When you have a aggressive cerebral glioma or a small cell lung cancers, for a very aggressive lung cancers or an aggressive cerebral gliomas, we use hyperfractionated. And hyperfractionated is when you give BD or TID doses. So you are giving more than five fractions. When you give more than five fractions, that is called as a hyperfractionated radio therapy. More than five fractions per week. And how do you give that more than five fractions per week by giving a BD or TID dose in the patient, right? So that is hyperfractionated radio therapy, usually used for aggressive tumors. What about hypofractionated? Hypofractionated is when you give less than five fractions per week. When less than five fractions per week, this is hypofractionated. Five fractions per week, this is regular or conventional radio therapy. And uh, hypofractionated is mainly a palliative method. When you have a widespread cancer, widespread bone metastasis, our intention is not to cure the patient that time. Our intention is to provide pain relief to just prolong him his life as long as possible without causing pain. For bone metastasis, for palliative therapy, we go for hypofractionated therapy. Right? Hyperfractionated for more aggressive tumors, hypofractionated when you are going for a palliative approach. Remember, more than 5 fractions per week when you have to give BD or TID doses is hyperfractionated. Less than 5 fractions per week, that is a hypofractionated. 5 fractions per week is a regular or a conventional radiotherapy. And what do you mean by accelerated? Accelerated is when you decrease this duration. So, when you are having this duration reduced instead of giving for you know 6 to 8 weeks when we are giving it in 3 to 4 weeks right so these are you know the faster duration that we have so this is faster uh, radiotherapy that is given so we are giving it accelerated form the name says accelerated right so accelerated not like uh, multiple fractions are given that is hyperfractionated but uh, i hope you got this right is this correct how many of you got this right anyone of you got this right question so, the answer should here be regular or fractionated or conventional radiotherapy. What did they give you? Whether they gave you it as a regular or conventional in the exam? What was given to you? Whether they mentioned it as regular fractional radiotherapy or conventional? But everybody told me that they saw 5 fractions per week and uh, that is your regular or conventional radiotherapy. Right? So, let us move forward. Now, there was another question. Chalo, nice, good Sandeep, right? Now, let us look at this another question. A 60-year-old patient on bed rest since 10 days develops sudden onset breathlessness and chest pain. So, there was a patient on bed rest for 10 days and develops breathlessness and chest pain. Chest x-ray was done. Chest x-ray was normal. Chest x-ray was normal. What is the best investigation in this patient? So, first you should understand a patient with bed rest developing sudden onset of breathlessness. Think of DVT progressing into pulmonary thromboembolism, acute pulmonary thromboembolism is given to you. The patient is having breathlessness after a prolonged bed rest. And for this, the investigation of choice, please remember investigation of choice for acute pulmonary thromboembolism, right? Acute pulmonary thromboembolism is CT angiography, CT angiography. So, this should be CT angiography, right? So, CT angiography. Is it clear? Have you got this right? Let us move to the next one. Remember the investigation of choice for acute pulmonary thrombolism and also the investigation of choice for acute IOT dissection. Remember these two emergencies, acute IOT dissection also. Acute IOT dissection, especially in stable patients, we go for CT angiography, CT angiography. Right? So, unstable patients, we go for transesophageal echocardiography. But for stable patients with acute IOT dissection, you go for CT angiography, CT angiography. And, uh, there was also one more question where they mentioned all the features of CRAB. We study this in all the you know topics, and there were multiple lytic lesions, usually osteochondroma or exostosis, exostosis, osteochondroma or exostosis, right? So this is a patient who is having a triangular bony projection growing away from the growth plate, and it is usually covered by cartilaginous cap. You don't see the cartilaginous cap on the radiographs. Cartilaginous cap, you will see it on. MRI. So, the cartilaginous cap will be evaluated on MRI. Did they mention you anything called as cartilaginous cap guys? Did they mention anything as cartilaginous cap in the question? Yes, no. Chochondroma or exostosis a very common benign bone tumor. The next one, a 2 year old child brought to the emergency with difficulty speaking, x-ray performed in the child is given below. What is the best treatment in this patient? So, there was a uh, child, a 2 to 3 year old child 
with uh, difficulty in speaking, resp difficulty respiratory distress or difficulty speaking and you are given a radiograph. Look at the image carefully. The image you can see here is located in a coronal plane. So, this is a coin in the esophagus, coin in esophagus. Coin in esophagus will be in a coronal plane. A coin in the trachea, right? So, that is important, right? So, that is important. Next thing, ground glass appearance of the lungs is seen in, where do you see a ground glass appearance of the lungs? A ground glass appearance of the lungs is, okay, the nodules that are formed in silicosis, they will produce this ground glass opacities in the lung, right? So, ground glass opacities on the lung will be seen with silicosis, just one liner, just learn that. Also remember ground glass appearance in COVID also we have, right? So, ground glass opacities, COVID-19, you see a diffuse ground glassing even in pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, right? So, these are also the other conditions which can be associated with. There was another question given on a CT or MR, they said on MRI there was a female having a mass in which was seen attached to the dura on the MR imaging. So, remember this is nothing but a meningioma. What are the clues towards this? One it is dural attachment, it has a broad base towards dura, broad base towards dura. On the imaging on the CT or MRI, you will see it attached to the dura and meningioma, right? So, name says it is attached to the dura. And meningioma is more common in females compared to males because of the uh, progesterone receptor positivity, right? Progesterone receptor positivity. So, it will be seen in a reproductive age group female, growing in, you know, reproductive age group, growing in pregnancy, shrinking postmenopausally, right? So, this is uh, the two important clues that you have. Do you remember two important radiological signs that they frequently ask about meningioma? Dural tail sign right the dural tail sign attached to the dura this was mentioned the dural tail sign on imaging as well as you see a mother-in-law sign the mother-in-law sign is the contrast enhancement pattern early enhancement and delayed washout early enhancement and delayed washout so these are important findings that you see in meningioma right so do remember this thing next what is the investigation of choice for neuroendocrine tumors uh, did you get this right? What is the investigation of choice for neuroendocrine tumors? What uh, did you um, answer this? What is the investigation of choice for neuroendocrine tumors? Now, remember for neuroendocrine tumors, we go for dotatate, dotatate or dotanoc which are somatostatin receptor, okay, dotatate or dotanoc PET these are somatostatin receptor positivity, right? So, there are the neurocrine endocrine tumors are somatostatin receptor positive and for evaluating those, we go for this dotatate PET as a investigation of choice, okay? So, dotatate PET is the investigation of choice for neuroendocrine tumors. Remember, DOPA PET is for pheochromocytoma. DOPA PET, this is used for pheochromocytoma. Right. So, remember DOPA becomes dopamine, right, and dopamine becomes as of catecholamines. So, that the precursor for all these catecholamines, right, is the DOPA. So, do, the same thing is used to evaluate this uh, catecholamine producing tumors like pheochromocytoma. Dotatate or dotanoc or somatostatin receptor unlocks, which go and bind to the receptor of the somatostatin receptor. So, they go, they go and evaluate neuroendocrine tumors. All neuroendocrine tumors, which are somatostatin receptor positive, will be diagnosed by dotatate PET, except insulinoma. Okay, please remember except insulinoma. Insulinoma is somatostatin receptor negative, somatostatin receptor negative. Except insulinoma, all other will be diagnosed by dotatate PET. And there were some image based questions that came in and simple image based questions, not very difficult, but you have to identify them. There was a horseshoe kidney on CT. In horseshoe kidney, keep two things in mind. Both the kidneys should be on either side of the midline. Both kidneys are on either side of the vertebra, either side of vertebra, either side of vertebra. And uh, you know, only inferior poles fuse, only inferior poles fuse. It had both the kidneys is the vertebra and you see both the kidneys on one side only. Then you are not calling it horseshoe kidney, this becomes a crossed fused ectopic, this becomes a crossed fused ectopic. So, to call it a horseshoe kidney, 
this both right kidney and the left kidney are on either side of the vertebral body and only their inferior poles are fusing. Do not confuse on the exam, right, whether it was a horseshoe kidney or a crossed fused ectopic. Look whether the kidneys were on either side of the vertebra. In the exam, it was most people have told you it was horseshoe kidney. So, we will go with that, okay. Next. Next thing. So, one thing is identifying the duodenal bulb, right, the first part of duodenum on the barium study. So, remember how to look at the barium uh, meal, right. You are seeing the stomach you are having the lesser curvature, the greater curvature, the pyloric antrum, the pylorus and the duodenal bulb formed by the first part of duodenum. And they also students said that there was another question on barium meal follow through. They gave a barium meal follow through and uh, in that they gave an arrow pointed like this and asked what is the structure, is it duodenum or jejunum like that. And when you look carefully, look at here, alveoli coniventus. So, there were two questions on barium, one question showing you the first part of duodenum, the duodenal bulb and the other one showing you this volvule coniventis, volvule coniventis or the plica circularis or plica circularis. So, these are features of jejunum, right. So, these are features of jejunum. The ileum is featureless, but when you see this plica circularis or volvule coniventis, this is jejunum. So, identify the jejunum on the imaging. Next. Uh, and uh, some students did say that there was also a barium swallow image and giving you different constriction of the esophagus. The exam, you know, tested heavily on the esophageal constrictions, right. There was uh, one question asking what is the structure that is compressing the esophagus at 25 centimeters from the incisor RT, right. So, that was your aortic impression, right, the ascending iota, the aortic uh, arch of iota compresses at 25 centimeters arch of iota. So, remember always the arch of iota will be higher and then you have the left main bronchus, right, which will be compressing the esophagus. So, first arch of iota and then you will have the left main bronchus that will be there. So, at 25 centimeters it is the arch of iota that is forming the indentation. And another thing they gave a barium study and they asked what, what is the constriction at this level. So, they showed a barium swallow and they asked what is causing the compression at this level and that was the left atrium indenting the esophagus. So, they ask you left atrial enlargement or left atrium showing indentation on the esophagus. I did, could not get the exact recall, but they said uh, the, the image was given and they asked you what is causing the indentation at that level. Left atrium indentation on esophagus was tested. So, two questions on esophageal constrictions and also the esophageal opening was asked, right, so in the anatomy. So, important to look at esophagus, two important questions. One is at 25 centimeters, what is causing the indentation? It is the arch of iota and uh, at uh, the lower end of the esophagus, right, near the diaphragmatic opening, the left atrium also, the most posterior chamber of the heart is left atrium. And when it is enlarged, especially left atrial enlargement in mitral stenosis, it causes dysphagia in our patients because of the compression of the anterior aspect of the esophagus, right. Yeah, so the question was asking you indentation over the left atrium. So, this is left atrium. So, two questions were there, two different questions were there. One was for arch of iota and one was for the left atrium, right. So, in the radiology part, the left atrium one was important. Next. There was also another uh, radiology images that were given, but I think management was asked. The question showed you all these different uh, images showing the dissection of iota, right. So, iotic dissection was shown and they asked you the management. Remember, if it is involving the ascending iota, the Stanford A, uh, surgical management is indicated and if it is descending iota, medical management is mainly indicated. So, but on the radiology aspect, you had to identify the iotic dissection, okay. So, image of iotic dissection was also tested aortic dissection, especially ascending aortic dissection I feel for which surgical management would be advised, okay, ascending aortic dissection. Most commonly is ascending iota, stand for day. X-ray diya gaya tha. Was it X-ray or uh, coronal CTs that were given? What was given on this? X-rays or coronal CTs? Was it X-ray or uh, CT scans that were given? Do you remember? There was a enlarged iota that was given, ascending iota, x-ray, okay, okay. So, they must have given you widening of the ascending iota in that area, right. So, okay, fine. Now, another question, uh, CT was given, Guru, Guru is saying CT was given 
on whatever okay they, they were looking at the clinical history also looking at the images also you should be able to pick up the iot dissection especially the uh, ascending iot dissection or uh, plan a uh, surgical management for the patient and uh, there was another question showing you a supracondylar fracture of humerus supracondylar fracture of humerus and they asked you which artery is compromised remember you need to remember supracondylar fracture of humerus a very very important topic and uh, remember the artery that is involved the artery that is involved is brachial artery the reason we have workman's ischemic contractures in these patients right is the compression of the brachial artery so important artery that is involved is the brachial artery so the answer was brachial artery if they have been asked the nerve involved in supracondylar fractures it is your anti interosseous nerve and interosseous nerve they gave you in the option anti interosseous artery but that uh, that is not the answer the answer should be brachial artery the most common artery involved in supracondylar fracture of humerus is a brachial artery the nerve is question they are asking snowstorm appearance was it was that there i am not understanding snowstorm appearance on antenatal scan or chest x-ray snowstorm appearance snowstorm appearance some students are mentioning snowstorm appearance so i mo i hope you have done that correctly this is molar pregnancy if that is not given if they are given chest x-ray what was given can anybody of you help me what was asked snowstorm appearance on chest x-ray or snowstorm appearance on ultrasound snowstorm appearance on chest x-ray this can be pulmonary microlithiasis alveolar microlithiasis small so I guess sandstorm or snowstorm like that and snowstorm appearance on chest x-ray is also classically seen with thyroid metastasis okay thyroid metastasis especially cancers from thyroid metastasis they can produce this x-ray uh, they did they, what what were the options uh, goblin if you can remember the options snowstorm appearance in which disease was this molar pregnancy or uh, thyroid metastasis mentioned asbestosis sandstorm snowstorm Bagosis, not an option. So that is on ultrasound. Okay, so we'll remove this. We'll remove this. Fine. Anyways, okay. Based on the options, okay. So snowstorm appearance on chest X-ray, it was mentioned. Do look at thyroid metastasis, papillary cancer of thyroid metastasis to the chest. Chest can produce that. Pulmonary alveolar microlithiasis produces sandstorm appearance. Okay, small uh, calcific areas called as sandstorm appearance on X-ray. So you can share me the all the options. I'll look into that. So that was uh, some important questions. So most of the questions were doable. I hope a uh, lot of integrated questions have come in. Lot of image-based questions have come in. It's not that you know questions are not there. Uh, on the images part so barium studies have been tested esophageal compressions have been tested okay so i hope most of you have got the questions right need not be 100% right okay even if you are scoring more than your 60 and 70% i hope uh, you are safe for the exam and hope okay all good right so do revise your topics uh, pyqs whenever you go to any exam in future also even for your next your next exam or neat pg examinations and all your pyqs remain an important part of your uh, preparation and uh, right take a much needed break guys okay so do relax for a few days spend time with your families and stuff do not worry about it hopefully most of you will get good results i have seen most of the questions are doable and i hope most of you are getting those questions right uh, and uh, one swelling one question swelling in the hypothenar arm muscles and i think that was a question on the same um, hyperparathyroidism they were showing that in context with brown tumor i had asked students about it uh, the swelling in the digit that was brown tumor that was mentioned in context with uh, this thing okay remember if it was a tumor mentioned it is enchondroma if enchondroma was there and uh, they asked you what is a tumor that is shown the answer is enchondroma but what was told to me is that was told in context with uh, hyperparathyroidism but if they had given you option of enchondroma yes a uh, tumor in the digits right so or the most common tumor in the phalanges most common in the phalanges right is your enchondroma enchondroma right so i hope you've got uh, most of the questions right and uh, dinner folk deformity was asked did they ask you dinner folk deformity was it mentioned dinner folk deformity this is malunited colis right so malunited colis fracture 
So, that should give you dinner fork deformity or dorsal displacement right that you have with coolies. So, that is it guys. So, most of the questions were pretty much doable. I hope you got most of them right. Take a much needed break, relax with your families and friends and uh, hope all of you have good results. I think the results date is uh, around uh, Feb 10th that was mentioned and I hope it turns out to be a good day for most of you right. God bless you guys. Have a good result. Okay. Thank you so much.